Catholic Church have a monopoly on the truth? The reasons for the Reformation, next on So What. Hi, I'm Chris Dorman. And I'm Don Waite. Welcome back to So What. We are looking at the five solas of the Reformation, and right now we are continuing our look at sola scriptura. Last week we looked at sacred tradition and how Rome and Protestants disagree on this very fundamental issue of authority. But you cannot look at authority and look at Roman Catholicism without looking at the papacy. Because ultimately, that's really, really the authority of the Catholic Church. So Don thought, since the, the popes claim a monopoly on truth, that we should play a game of monopoly and hopefully explain stuff as we go. Yeah. So Don, good idea. Yeah. What is the objective of our game? The objective is for Rome to prove that their claim to the papacy is the ancient, universal, and constant faith of the Church. Okay, that's what Rome's got to prove. All right, who's rolling first? Uh, you are. Okay, I'll roll first. Ooh, lucky number seven. I am the Mary figure. Ooh, I got a chance card. All right, chance card. Hey, hey, yeah, the infallibility card, baby. Oh, what does that mean? Get out of purgatory free. Ooh, so the Roman Catholics believe as of 1870 in Vatican I, they declared that the Pope was infallible. When he's speaking on faith and morals for the church, what he says, ex cathedra, is just like scripture. It is binding and authoritative for all Catholics everywhere for all time and has always been. All right, get out of Purgatory Free Card. That's valuable. Oh, a three. Wow. One, two, three. Constantinople. I'm going to buy it. Ooh. Oh, it's only 100 bucks. Those properties are cheap. <laughs> Thank you very much. 100 bucks here. Find your property out of there. Let me roll. Let's see what I got. A six. One, two, three, four, five, six. London. I'm going to buy it. There you go. You got your property. I I'm going to buy London. I'm going to buy it. 300. What you got? You One, got four, two, right? Three, four. Oh, chance card. Whoa, the Pope Gregory oh, card. Oh, dude, that totally sucks. <laughs> Go directly to purgatory and do not collect indulgences. Mm. So Pope Gregory was the Bishop of Rome from 590 to 604. And the reason why that's a really, it's the worst card on the, on the game is because Pope Gregory said that anyone who claims to be Pope or anyone who in their pride demands to be called Pope is showing the spirit of of Antichrist. Wow. <laughs> yep. So it doesn't support Rome's claim that the papacy is the ancient, constant, universal position of the church. He is the Pope, and he says it's ungodly. <laughs> All right, one, two, three, four. Woo-hoo, Treasury of Merits. I'm up, Treasury of Merit. Let's see what I got. Yes, the simony card. Remember, simony <laughs> is the practice of buying church offices. You don't have to be qualified. You just got to have cash. 250 bucks, simony. All right, what you got? All right. All right, where are you? I want to buy, actually, Chris, can I buy your Get Out of Purgatory free card? Oh, do I want to sell it to you? All right, give me a thousand bucks and you can get out of purgatory. Let's just say you just bought a bunch of indulgences, okay? All right. <laughs> out of there. All, right. Sorry. Sorry. Hey, all right, all right, that's fine. All right. Woo! All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Woo! All right, what do you got? The communion card. Oh, cool. <laughs> so it's not really communion, but, you know, he just gets uh, he just gets a little bit of a snack. It's kind of a nice little perk, you know? Just thought we'd just do something a little fun, you know? All right, my turn. I got to roll. Can you give me something to wash it down with real quick? <laughs> Are you kidding? No. Roman Catholics, the lady, they don't get the cup. Only the clergy does. You go thirsty. All right, all right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, Avignon. Oh, yeah, I'm going to buy that. You just roll. Remember, remember Avignon. Remember the Babylonian captivity of the church when the Pope was in uh, Avignon? All right, I got to buy that. That's 300 bucks. I got to pay for that. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, another chance card. Chance card, my friend. Oh, the Matthew 16 card. Ooh. Okay, wow. that's a big one. It is a big one. That's hey. a big one. So remember, Matthew 16 is when Jesus, he asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? Lots of different opinions at that time in his ministry about who Jesus was. Yeah. He turns around and asks the disciples, oh, Chris, he says, who do you say that I am? Peter comes forward and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and makes this great profession of faith that he is the Messiah. Jesus then says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. This verse is the verse that the uh, Roman Catholics use to establish the papacy. That's right. It's the primary That's proof right. text That's that right. they use. So the question is, is... 
can they really get that from this? And can they get that from the Bible? Can you build an entire dogma off one passage? A passage that, by the way, the early church fathers disputed what it meant. There was no genuine consensus exactly what this verse meant, just as there really isn't today. So when you're trying to find the interpretation of a difficult passage, what do you do? You want to allow the scripture to interpret itself. So you've got to right. look at what other scriptures say. Is there anything that can inform our understanding of this? Right. So when we start thinking about this idea of Peter being a bishop in Rome, do we have and, any and he will have successors right. after him. Is right. there any evidence of this at all in the scripture? Zero. No. None whatsoever. There are discussion in the scriptures about church offices, right? Absolutely. Elders, deacons right. are called up. And so, nothing about this idea of bishops, cardinals, and even more, the vicar of Christ. Archbishops, right. They're, the term, yeah, right. Just not there. Right? right, not there. So pretty simple. In fact, Peter, when he refers to himself... Oh, that's right, in 1st and 2nd Peter. That's yeah. right. He refers to himself as a fellow elder. Right. Right. And when Peter is facing his death, and he writes his last epistle, 2nd Peter, he says, look, I'm going to be dying soon. I want to be sure you remember what I'm teaching you. Right. And so I'm going to instruct my successor in what to teach you. No. That's not what he says at all. He says, no, I'm going to write it down. I'm going to write these things down so that when I'm gone, you'll always have my teaching with you. Awesome. Peter had no conception of a successor. Not, none not whatsoever. at all. What about in Acts 15? The so Jerusalem he, Council. Right. The Jerusalem Council, you have James in charge and not Peter. That's right. Right? That's right. So so really, what, what is that informing us of? That, that, that really the apostles saw each other as equals. They saw each other as equals. And then finally, what about the book of Romans? So Paul Good. wrote the book to the Church of Rome in about 55, 57. The Roman Catholic Church says that Peter was bishop of the church at that time. Right. Okay. Well, in that book, Paul addresses a lot of people in the church in Rome and conspicuously absent is any mention of, of Peter. Peter. No mention at all. Really? We're not going to mention the bishop of Rome? Right. The most, important, the most important Christian on the planet? We're not going to mention him? He's wow. not mentioned. Now, now Paul had no problem talking about Peter in his writings, did he? Absolutely not. When he was in Antioch, he he withstood Peter to his face. He says he rebuked him. So he right. he knows Peter. He calls him out, and right. and, and, and they have a respect for one another. In fact, That's right. Peter talks about Paul as well. That's right. So so where do you, where are they going to then be able to establish this? If we can't establish it from the word alone. Where are we getting it from? Sacred tradition. Mm. Sacred tradition. And again, universal, historic, ancient, constant faith of the church. The problem with that is, well, there's lots of problems. Biblically, they can't support it. And they say it's their tradition that this is the position of this passage and the, and the papacy. The problem with that is the Orthodox believers. Right. The Orthodox can trace their tradition as far back as Rome can. There's 300 million of them. And guess what they say about the papacy? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. heretical. They call it heresy. They say it's not part of the tradition of the church at all. They say that the idea that, that there's a pope, the idea that he would be infallible, that there's this one guy in charge of everybody, mm -hmm. is heresy. Again, here you have two ancient churches yeah. with conflicting traditions. So then what do you do? What you, do you do? you got to go back to the Bible. you got to go back to the Bible. This is what the ancient fathers said. That's but right. you know what? Even more importantly, Jesus points us to this idea in Matthew 15 right. when he's dealing with tradition as well. Right? That's right. That's you right. Know, the disciples are, you know, the, we have the Pharisees, you know, asking why aren't they washing their hands? And then Jesus schools them on their tradition, doesn't That's he, right. Chris? That's right. He, they're putting their traditions before the word of God. And you can go back and read this in Matthew. And essentially Jesus says, look, your traditions, whatever they are, they can't be more important than the word of God. The word of God always trumps tradition. You know, it's really then when you look at it, Chris, it's like this three-legged stool that we have sitting mm. over here. Yeah, that's a good point, Don. That's a good point. Rome actually oh. describes its leaders, its authority structure as a three-legged stool. Three-legged stool has three equal legs, right, that are all necessary for this to stay upright. They say one of the legs is the magisterium. The magisterium mm. is the pope working with the bishops. This is the primary teaching arm and leadership of the church. When Roman Catholics speaks of the church, they're really primarily speaking of the magisterium. Right. right. There's also uh, the Bible. They say this is obviously very important in this three-legged stool. Very important, equally important with the magisterium and then sacred tradition. All three are equally important, equally vital in, in, def in, in the structure of the church. Some problems with that, though. So in the Roman Catholic Church, who defines what the Bible says? 
Well, it's a magisterium. It's it's gonna be the Pope. They're That's gonna right. tell you what it says and what you are to believe. That's of right. It. Are you free to believe whatever you think you the Holy Spirit not. is telling you to believe? If you're you a Roman not. Catholic, no. no, no, no. You can only believe what the magisterium tells you to believe. So, the Bible's not equal to the magisterium because the magisterium tells you what the Bible means. The magisterium is not in submission to the Word. They're the authority over the Word. Okay. Yeah. Well, what sacred tradition? What about that? Is that Same equal? thing. It, you know what? Not really. Why? Because how do we even know what tradition is? Mm, that's the right. Magisterium, the Pope ultimately has the authority to define what tradition is and what it means. In fact, they're the only ones who know what tradition is. They have to pronounce, the Magisterium has to pronounce what tradition is. <laughs> Otherwise, nobody knows about it. They're the only ones who know about it. So, so, the, so the, the Magisterium is not in submission to tradition. The magisterium tells you what tradition is. Right. So what are we left with? We're left with the magisterium. We are left with sola ecclesia. And that's, that is the, that's what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about a three-legged stool of equal parts. We're talking about sola ecclesia. Mm -hmm. The church is the authority over everything. And for the Protestant, not at all. The Bible is our authority, and the church is in submission to the scriptures, sola scriptura. Right. That is it. That is our authority for the Protestant. And that is what distinguishes Protestants from Catholics. Absolutely. Thank you for tuning in, my friends. And I'll talk to you next week. See you soon.